If you take a look at Monster Hunter, Skyrim, Skyrim Special Edition, Skyrim Deluxe Edition, Skyrim V, and of course Skyrim for Microwaves, you will likely notice one thing. Most fantasy worlds have guilds, but few achieve such a real and genuine feeling of immersion as the Adventurer Guild of Overlord, a series of novels set in a medieval high fantasy world. So let's take a closer look at it. First question, what exactly is this Adventurer Guild? Well, they are essentially a transnational, decentralized, institutionalized, fiscal independent, rapid response force to any non-human threats to humanity. Which is fancy talk for a bunch of strong people hitting monster with club for money. So let's break all of this down in easily to understand parts. First and foremost, how exactly came the Adventurer Guild to be? Well, it was originally founded in the aftermath of the War Against the Evil Spirits, a costly campaign to contain a hostile invasion from Yggdrasil. Ancient heroes originating from the slain theocracy fought alongside various other humans from all over the world, such as the legendary assassin Iyanji, who founded an assassin guild on his or her very own. Other humanoids like dwarven heroes armed with ancient rune-crafted weapons and even entirely non-human entities to eliminate the demonic threat. A threat so severe that Platinum Dragonlord, the most powerful being in this day and age, alongside forces of the humanocentric theocracy. So after this devastating war where many cities and even entire nations were destroyed, the theocracy was still licking its wounds. And while their military was recovering, various beasts, demi-humans and heteromorph creatures once more threatened humanity within its very borders. Therefore they implemented a system to report, judge and dispose of these kinds of localized threats via the aid of mercenaries. This concept might be their very own, or it is based on the holy scriptures and oral traditions describing the deeds, actions and thoughts of their very own gods, who arrived 300 years before the evil deities first manifested. Additionally, it is quite likely that the theocracy also had a hand in spreading the guild's influence. Considering that the temples who are making an enormous amount of money by selling healing spells to customers, and who are willing to send assassins after traveling monks offering free healing to the poor and sick in order to protect their main source of income, I wouldn't expect them to just stand aside and watch as a potential concurrent grew and expanded. So without the theocracy interfering, the temples in all likelihood would have initiated a alpha strike in order to take out unwanted competitors. Because party members, skilled in healing magic, are an essential part of most adventurer groups and therefore a danger to their business model. But this is not what had happened since both transnational institutions are operating today besides each other. So therefore it is practically proven that the theocracy brokered a deal between the two which enforced strict regulations on the use of any healing magic from any guild member. But later more on this part. Furthermore, the theocracy ironically might have played a role in separating faith, guild and state from another, since introducing a foreign military organization full of powerful armed individuals under the theocracy's influence would have never ever been allowed to happen. The kingdom, the empire and any other nation would simply refuse to accept foreign proxy soldiers on their nation's soil. So therefore the guild had and has to be strictly neutral. And a major advantage that this neutrality brings with it is the avoidance of any loss of life on the guild's part due to political intrigue and warfare. Because neutrality goes both ways. And therefore no country may request adventurers to take part in human to human conflict, therefore assuring that the considerable military might of the adventurer guild will only be used against enemies of humanity. And while the theocracy slowly over the next 50 years or so made a full recovery and yet again was able to assert full control over their territory, the adventurer guild still remained a vital necessity in the kingdom and albeit to a lesser degree in the empire and other states. And to illustrate exactly how important the guild still is, just before becoming a tributary state under the sorcerer kingdom of Einzul Gaon, the empire with 8 legions each filled with 10,000 well-armed, armored and trained knights. 
aided by the Ministry of Magic under Fluda Paradain, who are still unable to keep the entire country free from monsters and other threats to humanity. Although it was still way more effective in doing so than the highly disorganized forces of the Reestai's kingdom. This inability of all states excluding the theocracy to fully cleanse or at least contain threats to their population is due to the centralized nature of any governmental structure. Monstrous threats oftentimes demand a rapid response to contain them. But before the Imperial Court is notified, before the Legion is notified, and is able to dispatch a portion of their soldiers to deal with, let's say, a raiding band of goblins and ogres, considerable damage will have been caused. And the same goes for any other state to an even greater extent. And this is where the Adventurer Guild truly shines. In contrast to any state, it can respond way faster in a more localized way. And even better, the guild is actively trying to prevent monstrous outbreaks by offering monetary compensation for any beast slain, as long as you can provide proof that a beast is dead. Presenting a cut of ear from an ogre or a goblin will usually suffice. And please also keep in mind that the adventurers operate in small groups, very rarely exceeding a dozen members, and thusly they are able to respond swiftly. Let's go through this a bit. If a beast, perhaps a big wolf, attacks a village or preys on their cattle, the village elder will travel to the local guild branch and request aid in exchange for payment. Part of the money offered is then used to pay wages to guild employees who then gather quest relevant information and also determine the scale of the threat posed by the monster in question. After this initial assessment, the quest will be made public so that any adventurer of matching rank can take it. But if the fee is not paid in full, the request in question will get a lower priority. As cruel as this may sound, this practice not only secures founding, it also ensures that the response is adequate. Because the guild obviously can't send out a group of top adventurers to slay a single wolf for a single copper penny, since these forces might be better used by taking on other, more dangerous quests. And even if they wanted to help, most adventurers wouldn't do it due to the great net loss they would suffer. In the world of Overlord, consumable items like potions or herbal medicines are quite expensive. And the same goes for equipment. And if the adventurers in questions are unable to earn the cost of maintaining their equipment and their items, sooner or later they will find themselves without any form of equipment, supply or ammunition, effectively interrupting their service until proper founding is secured again. Furthermore, the standing of the adventurers, especially among the nobility, is quite low. Don't get me wrong, their service is still valuable, and many normal soldiers might even admire them. But the higher up the social ladder you go, the more they are feared, despised, and oftentimes hated. And if the profession in question is frowned upon, at the very least it should pay well, especially considering that these people are risking their lives on a daily basis. So therefore it is, if the guild can't pay properly, the adventurers usually won't take the quest in question. You of course might get lucky if it's a lazy day, or convenient for an adventurer group to take it on, but again, it might take longer, or no one at all will show up. Additionally, another part of the fee is neither used for payment and provision of the adventurers, nor for the investigation into the threat post, but is required for the general upkeep of the guild. Things like rent, food, repairs, pay, and pretty much everything else. So to summarize this video, the Adventurer Guild might send you and your friends on a fantastic journey. Your team might be the first to rediscover some ancient lost city, or experience other great things. But such quests, because of their very nature, would not be only extremely dangerous, but also exceedingly rare. The day-to-day -day reality for almost all adventurers are quite bleak. They are mercenary monster exterminators. Necessary, but not well liked. And obligated to follow strict rules and regulations that seem unheroic at best, and oftentimes downright evil. If, for example, the local lord sends his henchmen to a village in order to collect tributes and taxes, you aren't allowed to intervene even if they hurt or kill peasants in the process. Even if they clearly plunder for themselves. Even if they take their daughters by force. No matter what, the adventurers have to stay neutral. 
And even if you stumble upon a crying child, slowly bleeding to death, because wounded by one of the Lord's minions, you are not allowed to use your healing magic in order to save it, unless you demand proper payment. Payment expensive enough that many lesser nobles would deny their second and third born sons any healing magic whatsoever. Even they would have to make do with herbal medicine or a simple prayer. So for all intents and purposes, you would have to let the child die. So oftentimes you are not allowed to help people because you have to be neutral in order to keep the peace between the guild, the state and the temples. And this is the grim reality of being an adventurer in Overlord. So today we are going to talk about the rank system of Overlord's Adventurer Guild. I will go through each rank in detail, but before that a quick explanation of what guild ranks essentially do. Well, they serve a variety of purposes. In my last video I talked about how it is used to keep inexperienced adventurers out of too much trouble by rank locking certain quests. After all, there's a difference between a dangerous and a downright suicidal mission. A important distinction many fresh adventurers can't make. But this is also a great motivator. By fulfilling your quests and adhering to the strict guild rules, you will eventually obtain a higher rank and therefore have access to better paying and more dangerous quests. Additionally, rank serves as insignia. You are going to instantly recognize the status, skill, prestige and wealth of your fellow adventurers. And in case of higher ranked ones, most normal warriors will think twice before attacking you, even when they outnumber you to a considerable degree. And last but not least, it serves as checks and balances, and thusly it is helpful in keeping the guild functioning. If, for example, a copper ranked adventurer makes more money by taking on fairly easy quests than any gold ranked adventurer earns by clearing way more difficult gold ranked quests, it's usually due to incompetence or downright corruption. And in these cases the higher ranked adventurers will make a fuss about it. They will notify their superiors of adventurers and other guild masters at other locations in order to solve this problem. So if something seems off, they will test you. And that's where Einzel Gaun comes into play. As mentioned, the adventurers take pride in their skills and rank, because they earned both in life and death battles. So if a newcomer shows up at your tavern and has expensive weapons and full plate armor, despite being just a freshly registered copper, the veterans will try to test you. Best case scenario for them, they expose a fraud. Worst case scenario, they ran into Momon and are in need of healing magic after being thrown through the tavern. And keep in mind, despite landing ass first on a healing potion and despite Einzel Gaun holding himself back, this iron ranked adventurer still needed additional healing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me break down the general implication of each guild rank in greater detail. And we are going to start with Copper. This is the lowest rank. Coppers usually operate in freshly formed teams of varying size. It is literally just quantity over quality. They will be able to take on only the most basic of quests. The quote unquote teams are also quite random, unproven, incohesive and prone to many avoidable mistakes due to a lack of experience and coordination. How do you set a proper perimeter? Coppers wouldn't know. Why it's oftentimes a bad idea to fire straight into melee? Coppers wouldn't know. How frequently should you take a redstone to your blade? Coppers wouldn't know. Which effect has the weather on upcoming battles? Coppers wouldn't know. Basic battle tactics. Coppers wouldn't know. What are the abilities of your team? Coppers wouldn't know. Basically they are like the first adventurer group in Goblin Slayer, but with even less in the way of magic firepower and competence. So Coppers will have to learn very quickly through either their own or their comrades mistakes, or sooner or later die in a rather horrible way. A general problem for many characters in Overlord. Additionally, Coppers are so weak that even the most mundane threat could kill them easily, if they overestimate their abilities. And as previously mentioned, their only real strength lies in their numbers, which implies that most solo or duo teams aren't going to make it. And because of their lack of proper funding and their general weakness, they will also use only the most basic of weapons. 
And with all of this said, let's take a look at the next guild rank, Iron. Most of the fresh guild members actually dream of becoming real, proper adventurers, traveling with their friends, protecting the weak, and generally just doing the textbook heroic stuff, until they either abandon their delusion in the face of grim reality, or because they have given up or died. But those who survive their first few quests, will start to adjust to the oftentimes bleak reality of being an adventurer in Overlord. In the process of becoming and being Iron Class, you will have learned how to improve, how to overcome, and how to coordinate with your teammates. And with more jobs done comes more experience, better equipment and better items. You also quite likely made a few mistakes, but you were able to survive them, so you got a proper taste of battle. You know how to handle stress, how to endure pain, and how to secure a retreat. And most importantly, that you can trust your comrades with your very life. In Iron Rank you are now able to employ basic battle tactics, and you also know the extent of your own abilities. You likely develop proper judgment, and now you can pick your fights. Unless you're drunk and run into Bone Daddy. Anyway, moving up to Silver. This is, or better, this was the rank Swords of Darkness held prior to their encounter with Clementine. Silver ranked adventurers are veterans of many battles, and will usually fight in cohesive teams, including coordination of melee combatants, ranged units, and magic casters all at once, without much in the way of talk or direction. This is now a fully functioning adventurer party. Everybody understands not only his own role, but also the roles and the capabilities of every team member by heart. And by gaining rank, experience and money, specialization also follows suit. Back in Copper Rank you had a guy in your team who was interested in nature, wildlife and weather. And he's now not only incredible annoying, but also your ranger. And therefore able to read tracks, spot incoming beasts and guide your group through pretty much any normal terrain. Also your casters will have specialized in certain types of magic, focusing on healing magic or the arcane variant. And you really want both types. Also your frontline fighters will usually know what the monster in front of you is capable of, how to strike it, how to avoid being stricken, and how to exploit its weaknesses. And your team leader now knows how to keep each and every body of you safe sound and focused on the same goal. At this point you will not only came to terms with how the guild works, you will also have formulated specific goals for your group, something to aspire to. Swords of Darkness for example, was founded on the very belief that they someday would obtain the four legendary swords. Most teams usually have something to direct and if necessary, rekindle their passions, which leads us straight to gold the highest rank any human without a nerd talent can obtain. This is the extent of the power of love and friendship in Overlord. This is what you can achieve by merit alone. You will be able to have some more advanced spells or a few select martial arts. But after that, your growth will essentially come to a complete hold. And this usually hits kinda hard. You have to be born for this profession if you want to advance further. The idea that talent means nothing and effort means everything is a core ideal of the hero's journey. A young, inexperienced hero leaves his home, embarks on an epic quest, ultimately saving the world from dreadful evil creatures, before returning home victorious and at the pinnacle of humanity. And this is an inspiring story. Somebody who was born with actual talent might experience some day. But this in all likelihood won't be you. And to make it even more tragic, the people who are indeed born with great gifts in regard to a certain job might actually end up disliking this very profession or are simply unable to prove themselves. Think of it that way. How many great writers end up with boring 9 to 5 office jobs? How many Einsteins are stuck working at a fast food restaurant in order to pay their bills? And how many dudes and dudettes with enormous body height simply aren't interested in basketball? For an escapist fantasy tale based on Isekai, Overlord sometimes really hits too close to home. 
and there's likely one task, one specific field of expertise we all have a genuine talent for. But in every other sport, in every other job, in every other way, we are all just climb. And with this rather sad ending, I will call it a day. In the next part we will discuss the truly superhuman levels of ranks. And some of those who can earn it by merit, because they were born to earn it by merit. We are going to dive deep into the lore of the elites. And we are going to start with the Platinum Plates. This is a rank you can only obtain if you were born with a higher level cap or a special talent. Basically you need something that will allow you to grow, the others would stagnate. Just let me give you an example what I mean. Two persons complete an identical workout routine in order to gain muscle. Person A is a very, very small guy who has problems gaining mass. Person B is a very, very tall guy able to gain muscle fairly easily. Therefore the exact same diet and workout routine will lead to a drastically different level in strength. This inequality is also one of the reasons for why adventurer teams might lose or gain some members. Or fracture entirely. For example, if Swords of Darkness hadn't run into Clementine, Ninja might have become platinum rank, while the others likely would have been capped at gold. Just think about it. She held the talent of magic aptitude and could therefore learn spells twice as fast. And with each level gained, one could learn up to three spells before a higher level would be required. Therefore, each level she would gain by strengthening her spellcraft would be gained with half the effort. So I therefore theorize that by pursuing her arcane path, Ninja eventually would have become a platinum plate. And if she was indeed solely focused on her magic skills, she might have gained this rank even before being above level 20, simply because she wouldn't have to waste levels for mundane things, such as cooking, like Brain Anglaus did. So only one person in the entire team of Swords of Darkness would have been able to achieve Platinum rank, which might lead you to ask exactly how common these ranks are. Well, we have exact figures at hand. The Kingdom of Rear's Ties, with its 8 million citizens, has only 3000 adventurers, and only 600 of them are platinum ranked or higher. So only 20% or 1 in 5 are fortunate enough to have the preposition necessary. And this ratio isn't random, but based on the Pareto principle. It was originally described by Wilfredo Pareto and simply states that 80% of the land owned in Italy is owned by only 20% of the people. And ratios like that seem to be pretty common. For example, in 1989 it was estimated that 80% of the wealth is owned by 20% of the people. And as far as businesses are concerned, usually 80% of all sales can be linked to only 20% of their customer base. So again, Overlord was a parallel between fantasy and reality, which helps to ground this setting. And with that said, let's move up even higher to Mithril. While not adventurers anymore, Team Foresight is equivalent to this level. Powerful, versatile and extremely experienced. They were able to survive highly dangerous life and death situations on a routine base. We are talking about threats to an entire city. And as a team they were at least able to withstand Eins Olgern himself for a limited time while engaging him in melee. And Eins's physical strength is equivalent to adamantite adventurers. And while normal adventurers would have to make do with fairly normal weapons, Mithril ranks have access to the truly elite equipment. For each expedition Foresight bought consumable items like potions or healing staffs for a couple or even a dozen gold coins. And normal Mithril adventurers would need to expand, let's just say half of that, simply because they have access to better infrastructure and will therefore get a more accurate description of the danger at hand. Let's just take a moment and compare this to normal adventurers. For Britta the red-haired ranger, a normal potion was extremely valuable. She skipped meals and quit alcohol for weeks or even months just to buy one single potion for the low price of one gold and ten silver. And not only their equipment is rare, Erentel, 
the fortress city, built at the center of multiple trade routes leading directly into the kingdom, had only three Mithril-class adventurer teams. And after Kralga was killed, under tragic circumstances, only two remained. Kralga, despite receiving multiple warnings, simply insisted on accompanying Momon on his quest to slay a legendary vampire. And let's just say right in the middle of the Shaltir incident, Eins's mercy was in high demand, but an extremely short supply. So a third of all Mithril ranked adventurer teams in Irantel overestimated their abilities. And the same applies to Team Hinsight. This raises another question. Why would Mithril ranked adventurers behave like they were freshly registered copper plates and overestimate themselves in such a manner? Well, think of it that way. You and your team was able to breach into a realm few will ever achieve and you still can go beyond even this rank. You're already quite famous, and you likely enjoy various minor special treatments by the guilds, and your pay is quite considerable. You're able to afford luxurious housing, excellent food, and magic items on a regular basis. Each accomplished mission, and each item, will bring you closer to your end goal, adamantite rank. Only two more promotions and you will wield it. And after slaying this vampire, you might only need one. So this second phase of hubris and misjudgment might kill many high-level adventurers, even if they have access to proper information. But some of them may survive and advance into Aurichalcum rank. Lockmire, the thief looking after Rena's watchdog, as well as Lockmire's team, are of this very rank. They manage to come into a close range of adamantite, but they choose to retire from active duty and were hired by Marcus Raven instead. And while normal nobles see adventurers as an existential threat to their power, especially because they are the source of many worker groups, Marcus Raven was a bit more open-minded in that regard. After all, he played a quite dangerous political game and therefore had a clear need for highly concentrated military power. Let that sink in for a moment. Even in retirement, your team alone is powerful enough to be a factor in power politics on a national scale. And to illustrate this point even further, if you're an Oricalcum ranked caster, you're likely able to use the fourth tier of magic, a skill very, very, very few possess. For example, the elite scholars of Fluda Paradain would also fall into this category. And while Mithril class are somewhat handicapped, Eurycalcum plates seem to be a bit more sensible and prepared. Because at some point, Lockmire and his friends realize that they are growing old and that adventuring will be more dangerous with advanced age. So instead of risking to die eventually, they choose to retire by getting a somewhat secure and low-risk job as the elite troops of Marcus Raven, one of the great nobles in a country constantly on the edge of civil war. And again, they were hired for good reason. If you survive decades in active service and retire as an Oricalcum class adventurer, not only will your power be almost unmatched, your experience alone will let you win battles before they even started. And again, let me give you an example. Lockmayer prepared countermeasures for the supposedly incarcerated illusion maniac, a member of the Six Arms, while watching Renner's watchdog. And dutiful to the very end, he and his team also ended their lives quite heroically. They died so that the Marcus may live. And even in the face of certain death, this Oricalcum class team remained level-headed enough to make this fatal decision on a moment's notice, even coming up with a strategy to maximize the chances of escape for Marcus Raven. Now that we've climbed to the top, we can gaze upon the highest potential rank any human may ever hold, Adamantite. This term encompasses the select few who stand right before or are even able to set foot into the legendary realm of heroes. This is also the reason the Adamantite rank is open-ended, because almost nobody has the faintest of clues what could come after this mythical realm of might. Therefore, the disparity between the power of teams and even team members is quite considerable. 
because almost nobody has the faintest of clues what could come after this mythical realm of might. Some groups stand at the lower end of the spectrum, having more in common with Orichalcum plates than true and proper adamantite ranked adventurers, like Silverfred Bird, who only obtained their plates due to flawless teamwork, the occupation of fairly rare professions and the slaying of one epic beast, rather than true individual strength. And on the upper end of the spectrum, we've got Evil Eye or even better, Momon. A hero that even on his very own is still powerful enough to fight against the Demon Emperor himself. And just to hammer home how ultra rare this rank truly is, consider the following. The kingdom with its 9 billion citizens has only two adamantite ranked adventurers in its entire territory. And Lachius, the leader of Blue Roses, decided to become an adventurer after hearing of the heroic stories of Luisenberg Alberion and his team, Red Drop. So for at least a while, there was only one adamantite team for 9 million people. And therefore, adamantite ranked adventurers might be actually as rare as one in a million. And being this special means that they are well and truly gifted. Lachius, for example, the leader of Blue Roses, is able to cast 5th tier resurrection spells and wield Kilinarium, the accursed black blade, at the age of 19. Remember Lockmeyer, who was just one rank below her? He supposedly retired in his 30s and was 40 years old at the time of his death, without ever wielding this much power and his vaguely defined but nonetheless superhuman level of strength and skill is one of the two things every adamantite ranked adventurer has in common. The second would be their status. If you watched my last video, you certainly know all these rules and regulations normal adventurers have to follow. Well, adamantite are the elite of the elite. They are truly special. They are essentially one-man armies. They are essentially main characters and therefore they can get away with some clear violations of guild guidelines. So if for example Blue Roses would make a transgression, perhaps by invading the domain of a noble in order to slay or capture any members of the Eight Fingers that for some mysterious reason just happened to be there, the noble in question would be screwed. Granted, he could simply deny any knowledge of this agricultural project but he couldn't do anything to Blue Roses either. No matter if the law states that only he, and he alone, may hand out punishment and hire enforcers at his own domain. No matter if he has to pay collateral to the Eight Fingers, and is now worse off than before. No matter how many times he rattles into the next guild building in order to whine and bitch. No matter if he screams so often and loudly, that he eventually will give birth to his very lungs, and no matter how often he tortures some poor receptionist with his foul breath while filing the 100 complaint about Blue Roses in this week alone, it will ultimately vanish into some sort of drawer or serve as a convenient way to start a nice fire. After all, who's gonna take down a powerful noble protected by Princess Rena that also is a badass warrior priestess armed with a legendary black blade that literally kills on impact. Guarded by even more flying swords, accompanied by a powerful caster, twin assassins and best girl herself, Gargoran. But even just on their very own, any adamantite adventurer is strong indeed. So the guild will usually ignore or downplay minor and mid-tier transgressions. For example, while holding court at Irantel, Ramposa III would allow a minor noble to try and recruit Momon and Nabe for the upcoming battle. Yes, we're talking about Splat. Needless to say, that Nabe was not amused. And while the noble somehow survived with only minor injuries, Nabe might as well just kill him on the spot, without too much in the way of repercussions. Not only the guild would look in another direction, even the king himself would rather deny any connections to the noble's action than risking a conflict with adamantite class adventurers while preparing for the war against the empire. Think of it that way. They basically would have to deploy Gazav Stronov, 
the strongest man in the kingdom, if a conflict between the crown and adamantite plate adventurers would occur, and the risk of Gazaf dying is quite considerable, even if he and his elite units were up against a normal adamantite ranked adventurer team. And remember, without Gazaf Stronov, the kingdom will most certainly fall in the next war against the Empire, since it may now deploy Fluda Paradain, without the risk of Gazef killing him in melee. And having a caster of the 6th tier casting magic is devastating. Not splat level of devastating, but still more than enough to break through the ranks of a mostly untrained peasant army. Being in an adamantite group is also a great way to get away the feeling the poor. While the temples will most certainly send assassins after you, you and your group will actually be able to fight back. Which is just what Silver Fred Bird did. And in case of Blue Roses, they even managed to recruit Tina and Tia. But not only the adventurers themselves are beyond powerful. So let's dive into their gear for a bit. While the normal citizen is oftentimes best off wielding spears for close quarter combat, simply because they are easy to use, have great range, and because they are fairly easy to obtain and maintain. And employ oftentimes makeshift bows at range, because by using them they can deal damage before a wolf, an ogre or brigands are able to harm you and your village. This fair lady here wields a magic warhammer that's heavier than a fully armed and armored knight. And she does so effortlessly. And remember when I said that adamantite plates are the equivalent to a small army? Well, actually, they are quite a lot better. They need far less food, they can deploy way faster, and they can make use of something called defeat in detail. Simply speaking, they might engage an isolated part of any army and use their full strength to massacre, let's say, 2000 men before retreating. And the man in question can't do a thing against it. So as long as they can achieve local superiority, and as long as they are able to dictate time and length of any engagement, given enough time, they could defeat armies and conquer nations on their very own. And Evil Eye at some point in the past did precisely that. So what I truly wanted to say for about 4 videos is, that despite the huge gap in strength, and despite the high fantasy setting of Overlord, the well fleshed out guild system greatly contributes to the immersion into this story. The guild ranks serve as an anchor point for, and a way to, describe different power levels. The rules and regulations allow insight into the mindset of adventurers, and into the agendas of various powerful institutions, and the status of legendary heroes has an actual impact on politics on a national scale, even before Momon earned his plate. Now let's continue with why the states just don't take up the responsibility of slaying monsters themselves. While indeed more advanced and militarized states, such as the Empire of Baharut, are more able to keep the roads and villages safe and free of monsters, thanks to their well-trained standing army, thus reducing the demand for adventurers. Even they need the adventurer guild, if the troops are deployed outside of the empire, or if very special types of monsters appear. Additionally, the various demi-human and heteromorph threats don't care about borders, and will cross it without much thought. But if none of the states are willing or able to attack the monster layers, out of fear of accidentally invading another nation, or provoking such an invasion, or in the hope that the neighboring countries will just deal with the problem for them, then the various monsters could grow their numbers and power uninterrupted, until it would require a major effort to root them out. And especially intelligent beings such as Elder Liches could make use of this tactic. The Adventure Guild however operates across borders, and thus it deals with the problems in a timely manner, before they get out of control. Additionally, the Adventurer Guild are highly specialized in dealing with monsters in small units, while most armies are primarily concerned with large-scale battles, and lack the experience to deal with the myriad of different threats the various monsters could pose. So even though the Adventurer Guild is a foreign entity, with an incredible military power, that operates within the various states, the states will have to tolerate their presence for their own benefit, since the demand of monster slayers is higher than their supply of sparable troops. On the flip side, while the Adventurer Guild commands a sizable military force, the guild just can't use it to wage war on states, 
since a. their entire revenues depended on states, towns, villages and nobles, handing out requests and more importantly, payment, and b. the adventurers are there to protect humanity from monstrous threats, and not to fight fellow humans, especially not without payment. Thus, even though the Adventurer Guild has elite forces that alone could take over towns, and that in general have a much higher proficiency, the Adventurer Guild isn't an actual threat to the states they are operating in, and since they are reliant on the states for letting them operate, they are also willing and able to enforce strict neutrality. For example, if the Adventurers witness a plundering army that is currently slaughtering a whole village, then they are forbidden from interfering. Also, while the members of the Adventurer Guild are exempt from paying the obscene temple enforced prices for healing magic, they are only allowed to heal fellow adventurers. And if they heal other people, then they absolutely need to charge the normal price. Furthermore, if a state should ever mandate to support their armies against another nation, then the adventurers themselves, who are way stronger than most of the normal soldiers, and who are already used to operate in small units, away from the safety of settlements over extended periods of time, would just be able to leave without problems. And the state would then be shunned by its neighbors, leading to all sorts of embargoes and punitive invasions. And without the adventurer guild, the military itself would have to take over the responsibility of adventurers and slay monsters themselves. Thus, it will weaken itself and the state, while the common folk would suffer much more on the monsters. Thus, the economy would also be disrupted. And therefore, the current situation is beneficial to both parties. The adventurers get an extremely high paying job. The states and the nobility, even though they dislike the thought of having armed organizations within their borders, can just throw money at any monstrous problem to make it go away, simply by requesting and paying for guild aid. And last but not least, the adventurer guild can finance itself and its anti monster operations, and thus protect humanity from the many dangers of the new world. And since the guild specializes in killing monsters, Money spent on adventurers will yield a much higher return on slain monsters than money spent on normal soldiers, especially since the sheer quantity of soldiers required to control and exterminate monsters would put a strain on the economy, since peasants that are fighting monsters won't tend to the fields. One could expect that the guild in order to protect humanity only cares about results and not about the adventurers. After all, the new world is quite the harsh place, and lost adventurers are nothing too uncommon for the guild. On the flip side, who better to judge the strength of adventurers, the quality of their equipment, their knowledge, and their skills than the adventurers themselves. If a bureaucrat forbids an aspiring adventurer from slaying a goblin tribe that's currently nesting in his hometown, then grain and life could be lost. After all, he had already proven that he can slay goblins to himself by dealing with an old goblin that had sneaked into the barn a couple of months prior. But unsurprisingly, the guild doesn't follow this hands-off free market approach and is interfering with this particular job market for a couple of very good reasons. You see, every monster hunt is a calculation between risk of injury, loss of life and that one thing goblin slayer tries to prevent. On one hand, and the handsome reward on the other. But rookie adventurers can't judge their own abilities in relationship to the monsters. And the guild knows that unnecessary loss of life will both weaken their ability to combat threats to humanity, as well as deter potential rookies from joining. Last but not least, the adventurer guild is an armed organization without state and noble oversight, and thus a steep increase of death and a decline of overall effectiveness would at the very least put them under close scrutiny, and thus newbies would have to prove themselves even more, due to political pressure. Not to mention that a decrease in adventurers usually leads to an increase of monstrous threats, which runs contradictory to their main mission, protecting humanity. Therefore, the ranks essentially state which risk-reward relationships you, as an adventurer, are capable of judging. Because in essence, without prior experience, nobody can adequately judge their own risk reward disposition. For example, while in our own world, return on investments are stated in percent, a rookie investor won't know that 2% might just be treading water with inflation, that 7% 
on average are solid gains, that 15% symbolizes a very high risk reward relationship and that 200% gains per annum are a telltale sign that something is very wrong. Remember BitConnect? Somebody with no money does for sure. And it's the same with adventurers. A fresh copper adventurer won't know the difference between hunting down an old goblin in a barn or rooting out a hole. To him and potentially his team, they are just goblins. But if the goblin nest offers 20 times the reward, the rookies might think to themselves that they are much better off with dealing with 10 goblins instead of just one goblin, since they get paid twice per head. But what he doesn't take into account is that fighting while outnumbered against a family hellbent on defending their young and their comfy place, where all the grain is stored, and leaving would just mean dying of starvation or freezing to death in the harsh winter, is on a whole other level than dealing with an old goblin that came into a barn to lick his wounds. So in spite of what animated nightmares like this would lead you to believe, a baby can't become a CEO of a company for the same reason a copper adventurer can't take on adamantite ranked requests. The guild turns what would just essentially be survival of the fittest into a meritocracy where any up and coming adventurers, no matter from where they are, how they fight, how strong they seem to be, or what kind of spells they claim to wield, have to prove their merit by repeatedly fulfilling quests and exceeding expectations. Only after thorough testing, a higher rank will be bestowed upon the successful adventurer, who then once again will have to prove themselves capable in order to rise again. For example, Momon did not only slay these goblins and ogres, he also subdued the wise king of the forest and made him his pet. And yet still, only after he saved the guardsmen from an incredible horde of zombies and killed the local cell of Zurnorn, was he awarded the rank of Orikalkum, despite the clearing of the graveyard alone, was above almost any normal adamantite adventurer's capabilities. Only after he dealt with the basilisk and harvested ultra-rare herbs from an evil tree demon with so much HP that even Aura couldn't judge it adequately, was he finally awarded the highest guild rank. And last but not least, while the requirements are strict, there are ways around all of these restrictions for sufficiently skilled adventurers. Requests by name, for example. This, as you probably already guessed, means that a customer requests a specific adventurer because he wants to hire only this adventurer. Of course, an adventurer with the abilities of a copper rank wouldn't be famous or well-known enough and does not request it by name for anything out of his normal capabilities. However, strong adventurers who had just taken up their profession are able to leave enough of an impression that they might be requested by name. And since they can't pick up any other high-paying job normally, the strong adventurers will have to sell their time under market value in order to prove to the guild and the requestee that they are indeed capable of what they claim to be which is part of the reason why Momon could rise through the ranks so rapidly. And even Momon was only able to be requested by name, because he tossed an iron-ranked adventurer through the room like it was nothing, and handed away a God's Blood potion like it was nothing to him, which had led to Nfire Balia's request, since he and his grandmother were able to at least somewhat understand the scope of his strength, and because he wanted to learn more about the potion. Another option is to join or accompanying an already established group, in which case the higher ranking adventurers, who had already proven themselves, are trusted and expected to judge the abilities of these newcomers, and to take care of them in exchange for the time and the labor of the upstart. And even then Momon received only the equivalent of a silver ranked patrol and escort mission with an escortee that won't run straight into hordes of monsters, which as far as I'm concerned is something fairly uncommon and straight out of a fantasy world. I wonder if egg quests are also easier in Overlord's new world than in the new world of Monster Hunter. Noise cancelling headphones as far as I'm concerned should be the standard equipment. And fun fact, the guild of Monster Hunter functions on the same basis 
as the Adventurer Guild from Overlord. And speaking of it, what has the guild gained from all of this? In essence bankruptcy aka the loss of an adventurer would hurt them way more than a quest that had to be postponed for a certain amount of time, which in this analogy symbolizes a missed gain and thus the guild can cut its losses for a bit less of a profit, which would be slain monsters. And if the adventurers are allowed to slowly level up and gain strength, then ultimately the guild would also gain way more this way than letting any newbie adventurer group on their own judge their strength and run straight into the next goblin layer without a goblin slayer. Last but not least, to stay alive is also in the interest of adventurers and workers aka ex-adventurers that are working on their own without oversight or regard for the law on that matter downright miss the ranking system since they have nobody to judge for them. And the only one who has grown old in a profession where people die young is Palpatra, who constantly sacrifices potential gains for the safety of himself and his group. And even he eventually made a big career ending mistake. And yes, I also have done a video or two about workers. Link as usual in the description. And with that said, thank you very much for watching and special thanks to Al Capone, Andy, Angel of Death, Bad Guy, Boyzilla, Chrissy, Diabetic Centaur, Dystopia, Faily Skaters, Gigafight, Ghost of Epicness, Hector Moreno, Hoss, Jason, Kleinator, Chromius, Large, Lord Touch Me, Lord Ulbert Elaine Odell, Matt, Matt C, Marcos, Mr. Shoes, Mindless Wrath, Minnow 13, Mirtis, Primus 11, Sasuga 1 Sama, Sebastian, Surge, Sparkly Unicorn, and the Shore Guy. Thanks, guys. Anyway, have a nice day. Over and out.